Okay, um, it's 11.01 and aloha and a very warm welcome to all of you, our participants. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is the first of six webinars that will be introducing and sharing highlights of the 2022 statistical report for the Hawaii State Plan for a data-driven system of care on substance use. My name is Devro Talangi and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Before we get started with our presentation, I would like to give a few housekeeping reminders. First, this is a Zoom webinar event, which means that you, our audience, are able to see us, the panelists, but we cannot see you. There are two ways to interact with us in between yourselves. The first is through the chat window, which you should be able to see on the Zoom status bar. And the second is through the questions and answers window, which you should also be able to see. We really do encourage you to post questions and comments as well as int introduce yourselves as it will help all of us to make the most of this one hour that we have this morning. Our panel and team will try to answer your questions as they arise. However, we also do have time allocated for discussion at the end, so our panel may try to answer your questions at that time. Please also note that we will have three poll questions that will be posted throughout the presentation. Finally, we will be providing the slide deck with all of the supplementary material contact information and links to all of our participants after the webinar. A recording of this presentation will also be available next week. Okay, now I would like to introduce our panel. Our first panelist is John Valera from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. John is the Acting Administrator of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division and in that role is the sponsor for the State Plan Project. He has served at the ADA in various capacities since 2016 and is a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners. He has a master's in urban planning from the University of Hawaii and a bachelor of science in planning and public administration from the University of Southern California. Our second panelist is Dr. Victoria Fan from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Victoria is an associate professor of health policy at the University of Hawaii and is also the principal investigator of the state plan project. She is an FXB Fellow at the Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, an Adjunct Fellow at the East West Center, and Visiting Fellow at the Center for Global Development. She earned her Doctor and Master of Science in Global Health and Population from the Harvard School of Public Health, and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Our third panelist is Dr. Jared Euro, also from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. Jared has a Doctor of Psychology degree from the United States at Jasper University. And he completed his Master's in Education at Columbia University and received his Master's in Psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology, San Diego. He is a licensed psychologist and since 2002, he has worked for Hawaii Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, where he serves as Chief Clinical Officer, Clinical Psychologist Supervisor, and currently as Acting Public Health Program Manager. Welcome to our panelists. Again, my name is Devro Talangi, you can call me Dev, and I am your facilitator for today. I am an assistant researcher at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and co-principal investigator of the Data Infrastructure Core of the State Plan Project. I'm also a lead data scientist at the Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative and the lead author of the 2022 statistical report. This presentation is separated into three parts. First, our panelists will introduce the overall state plan project. Then we will introduce the statistical report, and then we will provide some highlights from chapter two of the report itself. Again, we have allocated about 20 minutes for discussion at the end. So please do post any questions that you have for our panelists. Since we only have one hour for each webinar, our goal for this webinar series is to introduce and highlight some of the findings from the 2022 report. If you are interested in viewing the current draft version of the report, a link and password is now being provided to you in the chat window. Please note that since this draft is still in the consultation process, it is a view only version and is not available for download. Alternatively, you can also view the highlights provided in the webinar, either in an interactive or infographic format at the Hawaii Behavioral Health Dashboard. That link is also being provided to you right now in the chat window. Lastly, before I pass it over to John to start our presentations, we have our first poll question, which should be showing up 
on your screen now. The question is, prior to this webinar series, had you ever heard of the Hawaii State Plan on Substance Use? I will give you a few moments to provide your answer. Okay, thank you. I will now hand it over to John for the next section. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I see many familiar names in the chat. Hope you can see me as well. And Dev, I'm pretty surprised that everyone voted so quickly. <laughs> but again, it was, it was that, that was a great question to start us off. So this is the webinar one uh, intro and overview of the state plan and substance use. So there's a slide here that kind of captures a bit of history over since the 70s. So I'm going to do my best to kind of, in a nutshell, um, lead you to how we ended up here today. First, a bit of history about the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division of the Department of Health before we talk about the state plan on substance use. First off, the Hawaii Revised Statutes, Chapter 321, Part 16, is what is the enabling law that enabled uh, the Hawaii Substance Abuse Program to be created within the Department of Health. From 1975 to the early 90s, the Substance Abuse Program was an organizational branch of the Adult Mental Health Division, or AMD. Uh, in the late 90s, the Substance Abuse Program became a separate division, the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, which it is today. Since 1972, other mandates that affect ADAD, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, include um, the statutes that talk about the Hawaii Advisory Commission on Drugs and Drug Abuse and Controlled Substances called HACDAX, which is uh, these statutes I'm talking about are in other places. So HRS chapter 329, which is the public safety chapter. Uh, there's also HRS 329E, which is the Overdose Prevention and Emergency Response Act and certain parts of HRS chapter 334 which is the mental health chapter. Now, regarding the state plan on substance use. The state plan for substance abuse is the term that's used in the law, HRS chapter 321, part 16, okay? It was passed by the legislature back in 1975. As mentioned, there are other substance abuse laws, as I just mentioned previously, but uh, this one I'm talking about is the core enabling legislation that eventually led to the creation of ADAT. The state plan for substance abuse is also required according to the Department of Health laws. Uh, it has to be prepared, administered and implemented, and it may not shall, consists of a plan for alcohol abuse prevention and a plan for drug abuse prevention, okay? Um, my predecessors, previous administrators of the division preferred to keep it for a while as one plan. In other words, one plan would talk about substance use, use prevention and substance use treatment and recovery, one document. Um, they preferred to keep it as one plan mostly, but teased out separate chapters on different topics of interest, priority topics that were important at the time. And so uh, this chapter 321 is basically the heart of it, uh, of what ADAD does, is supposed to do. It gives the general responsibilities of the division. 
The state plan on substance abuse also has to be reviewed annually, okay? And to that effect, ADAT has produced and written, prepared and released annual reports to the state legislature every December for the following session, which takes place the following January. Um, it also says, the law says all, that the HACDEX, which is the Hawaii Advisory Commission on Drugs and Controlled Substances, shall advise the Director of Health on all matters regarding substance use, including the state plan for substance abuse. So every year we give an annual report to the legislature and the intent of which is to detail progress on implementation of the mandates in the law. The law also gives us uh, options in our tool belt. For example, ADAD may adopt rules to carry out any part of the statutory requirements and also hire staff. So the state plan on substance use is intended to be a more comprehensive uh, statewide study on substance use services, but not just the services, but what are the needs and what are the opportunities um, that, that are presenting themselves. So to recap, the state substance abuse plan has not been updated since the last one was adopted in 2000. The first comprehensive plan for substance abuse was released by Governor Ariyoshi in 1976, shortly after the uh, Department of Health statute was amended to add, enable the substance use program. The plan received subsequent revisions, as the slide says, in 1989, 91 to 93, 94 to 97, and in the 2000 version of the plan, the treatment uh, components were split into separate documents, which kind of brings us to today. I just wanna have offer a couple notes on how the plan evolved since the 1970s. The 70, 1976, 77 plan um, was not a, not a comprehensive plan, but a plan focused on public and private agencies that receive federal and state support to give substance use services. It involved also heavy coordination with the county governments, the county mayors, to maximize the utilization of community resources in providing feedback to the plan. The 1989 plan came up, it was, it, now, this is a fundamental, what it did, which was uh, instrumental. It came up with a comprehensive framework for a substance use system that involves coordination and cooperation between public and private agencies. Uh, the 1989 plan had four focuses administrative, service delivery, data, and quality assurance. For both treatment and re recovery and prevention. The 1980 plan, all, 1989 plan also advocated to have a forum for continued discussion among ADAT and its, and, and its partners uh, Continued discussion leading to common understanding among agencies, providers, lawmakers, consumers, and the public. The results of the forum, participation in the forum, would then result in action plans, common goals, and objectives. So this 1989 plan uh, came up with this comprehensive framework. So the 1991 to 93 plans uh, basically took that 1989 plan and tried to implement it. They, they started to compare 
alcohol and drug data nationwide versus Hawaii for, al for, for adults and for students. Back then, the categories were alcohol and drugs. Uh, for students, um, they found there was a high use of marijuana, tobacco, and over-the-counter drugs. Um, for Native Hawaiians, there was some, the, there was reported a high alcohol use. Um, and then for other populations, uh, higher than usual use for, you know, for marijuana. Um, and it also talked about injection, IV drug users uh, with HIV infection. The 1991 to 93 plans also uh, combined prevention and treatment. It talked about both prevention and treatment into one document. It listed who was providing services and whether they were state or federally funded. And then it had sections on prevention and treatment services that were needed with goals and objectives and implemented st and strategies on how to implement those services that were needed. The 1994 through 97 plans continued the pattern, but it also added sections on number one, criminal justice system, those with substance use in the criminal justice system, as well as dual diagnosis clients. So those with substance use who are wrestling, struggling with mental health issues. The 2000 plan um, added sections on separate focus on treatment and it reported treatment service issues on the neighbor islands and it focused on adults, adolescents, criminal justice clients, pregnant parenting women with dependent children, injection drug users, and those with co-occurring use disorders. So in other words, it continued the pattern. It tried to implement the framework that was set prior. In 2001, there was a child welfare and treatment plan focusing on treatment, a special understand, uh, it was sort of a special on understanding the child welfare system and substance use needs, current services and opportunities for collaboration with the Department of Human Services. The State of Hawaii Treatment Needs Assessment in 2004, it wasn't a comprehensive plan, it's more of a needs assessment that focused on adults. For the sake of time, we don't, I, mean, it, it, I could get, we could report on it later if, if, you're, if you're interested. The bottom line of this slide is that ADAD stands on the shoulders of giants. There are those who have gone before us that have established a framework for creating a comprehensive plan. Their goals were noble and the, uh, and the challenge remains, which kind of brings us to today. Uh, today we have a different, the, our, the, the the issues that we face are, are different than what was faced decades ago. And so it causes us to be, in order to be, the intent is to be comprehensive, uh, but also to try to collect as much information we can and to network and to involve as many stakeholders and community partners as we can to develop something that a plan that is useful and that can reach those who need services but aren't currently getting it. So how do we, why do we need this state plan? Just to recap, um, it, has not, it has not been updated since the early 2000. Um, there's no substance abuse program no substance abuse program is implemented exclusively from other components of the system of care. So substance use rehab, treatment, education, research, and prevention 
are not perceived as five separate systems, but are part of a unified whole. So some providers refer to gaps in the system of care as lacking that warm handoff. When for instance, a patient or a client receive, leaves one provider for another, uh, or when finding a provider takes longer than expected, or when an offender uh, with substance use and re-enters the community. The goal of the role of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division is to coordinate the different substance abuse activities as they become necess medically necessary to improve the total health of the client. The ADAT has a mandate to know also every payer program and type of resource available, whether local, statewide, or national, that addresses substance use in order to better efficiently coordinate those resources into a seamless system of care, whether or not they're funded by the division. Full awareness of resources for a community also leads to an improved system of care through coordination of these respective programs, public or private. Okay, next slide, please. So this encapsulates why, why we need the plan. You know, substance use affects everyone in our community and um, we, we need to constantly improve the system of care. All right, and to that, ex to that, to that end, we partnered with the uh, Center on Aging at the University of Hawaii School of Social Work, as well as the uh, John A. Burns School of Medicine's Department of Psychiatry. Now this pyramid talks about the approach that we took. Again, the goal of the, this state plan project was to assist ADAD to provide a state plan that emphasizes a, a data-driven system of care, but one that builds, I, I, I believe, needs to build also on the comprehensive framework that was outlined in previous state plans. Um, the, so the foundation of our state plan project was to enhance the data-driven system of care and to help ADAT via the, a, a discovery-oriented approach to substance use and misuse and related data. So that, that's protocol one, that data infrastructure. So this state plan project is actually comprised of four parts or protocols. And from the data, from the proposed analysis of the data, um, implications chapters, which is protocol two, uh, will highlight the system of care, uh, what it currently does and what it needs, recommendations and what it needs, inclusive of substance use, misuse trends, and by emphasizing the in intersections of substance use with mental health, homelessness, criminal justice, juvenile justice, family violence, primary care integration, and so on and so forth. Um, it also is intended to uh, address the needs of the rural communities, Native Hawaiian communities, sexual and gender minority communities, and young people through emerging adult to through adult populations. In particular, there was an adult treatment needs assessment, uh, which is protocol three, that's the third part, uh, which was conducted both quantitatively, you know, that's the data part, and then qualitatively with a focus on the emerging adult population, because that's a population that ADAD knows very little about, to explore the needs, supports, barriers and gaps, in areas for improvement uh, in the system of care. Finally, because we're home to the most ethno-culturally diverse population in the, in the state, in the, in the country, the state, state of Hawaii is poised as a leader in culturally informed care. And so protocol four uh, is, involves a native Hawaiian case study, which takes a native Hawaiian approach to substance use or misuse um, uh, via a case study of uh, doing collaborative interventions in a community organization which does youth prevention. 
and use treatment. So each of these four kind of builds on each other and the intent is to hopefully be more comprehensive. All right, next slide. So again, these are the chapters that I mentioned. Um, there's an overview chapter. Uh, there's, there's one on primary care integration, but also separate chapters on mental health, homelessness, criminal justice, juvenile justice, family violence, and um, also chapters on Native Hawaiians, uh, the needs of Native Hawaiians, uh, rural health, pregnant parenting women, and sexual and gender minorities. With that, I wanna uh, hand it off to Dev, who will lead us into our next segment. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Toya to take this next section. Great. Aloha, everyone. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all. We're so excited to see, I think, now 76 attendees uh, attending this webinar. So we'll try to keep it as fun as possible. I know when people see the word statistics or data, it's already an immediate turnoff. So our objective in the next uh, few slides is to make it make data fun and interesting and engaging. Uh, so, so next slide, please. So uh, just to give you some background here, our statistical report um, is really protocol one of this larger state plan project. So the idea is that the state plan requires broad sources of information about the ways in which substance use impacts our society. And it serves as sort of the platform by which all of the other chapters uh, and focuses uh, sort of build upon. Um, so really it's providing an overview of substance use and substance use treatment in terms of primarily a data perspective. Uh, and one of the key focuses uh, that we were sort of tasked to do uh, was to identify sort of the prevalence of substance use and the number of people receiving treatment and also the number of people who need treatment but are not yet receiving it. Okay, so our work, as I reflect, you know, where we are in 2020, um, back to the beginning in 2019, and I'm looking at John virtually here, but, you know, from 2019, to now it's really been a three year gestation process of so much work, um, not uh, very little work by myself, but really so much work uh, by uh, Devro, Talangi, Dev, as well as the many team members here that you've seen, Rachel and Talan, Shelby, McKee, Jacqueline, uh, Topinio, uh, Sarah Yasuda, and many of our, our other teammates who started out primarily as undergraduate students helping us to wrangle uh, the data. So this work uh, utilizes a standardized analytic framework, uh, which is a enables us to do reproducible updates in the future. So it minimizes the effort that's needed to do this type of work. Rather than doing a big data analysis every 10 or 15 years, uh, we hope that this will be able to be done much more regularly in the future. Uh, and it, it's also needed to help assist ADAT to plan and develop this data-driven system of care. Next slide, please. So, uh, this is our first uh, webinar, uh, and following uh, today, we have uh, five more webinars that we sincerely invite you and hope you will attend as well. So today is the sort of the broadest focus, providing the overview of substance use as well as the state plan, uh, and the subsequent webinars focus on specific chapters of the statistical report, the statistical report. So our next webinar uh, next week will focus on mental health and homelessness and their intersection with substance use. Uh, on June 3rd, we'll have a focus on criminal justice and ju juvenile justice as it pertains again to substance use. And then June 17th, uh, a focus on rural communities and Native Hawaiian communities. And then June 24th, we'll focus on family violence as well as pregnant and parenting women. And then finally in uh, July, uh, we'll have our final uh, section on sexual and gender minorities as well as linkages to care uh, through primary care. Okay, so with that, um, we'll move on now uh, to our next slide, which is the poll question. So the question is, what sectors do your services intersect with? And please uh, check all that apply. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges of this work is it intersects with so many different sectors, right? Substance use, 
uh, plays a part in mental health, homelessness, criminal justice, juvenile justice, violence, and so many other sectors. Uh, and we seek to involve and collaborate with all of you actually uh, for your inputs and feedback to make this report more relevant and useful to you. So I'm looking at Dev to give me a, a look here when, when we know that the data has been collected, but um, we'll give you maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, great, next slide, please. Sorry, we are at the next slide. We have another poll question um, here, poll number three. Oh, thank you. Um, so the next question is, what communities do you provide services for? So again, part of our challenge of the state plan is that we had both sectoral focuses as well as sort of community focuses. And so they sort of intersect constantly, both in terms of sectors, as well as populations and communities, also making it uh, more challenging uh, to reach out to all the different interests and stakeholders out there. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you for your inputs and we'll share, I, I believe we'll have a chance later to share the inputs from the poll questions later on. Okay, so now my job is to not make you all fall asleep and I'm gonna try to give a high level overview of the chapter two, uh, which is the overview of substance use in our statistical report. So next slide, please. So the, sub, the subtopics of this chapter really cover four different areas. And so it starts out primarily with a focus on prevalence, right? So that was one of the main questions of interest, which is uh, what is the prevalence or number of people um, who have substance use, abuse, and dependence issues? And then we progress on uh, next to questions about emergency visits and hospitalizations, death, mortality, and then crime and violence. Uh, and I'm really pleased that I believe John uh, will be sharing a bit about the hospital data. Um, and uh, Jared will cover uh, mortality and crime and violence. And this, will, this slide obviously shares the different sources of data that we utilized. Um, and again, if you have more questions about any of these uh, sources of data, or if you have data that you would like to contribute to be part of this uh, state plan, you know, please reach out to us and we're happy uh, to meet and discuss any of these data sources with you. But, it was an enormous task. Uh, even one data set alone is, is challenging, let alone uh, so many data sets. Okay, next slide, please. So first on substance use, abuse and dependence. Okay, dependence. So we're first focusing here on substance use in the past year. And we've got it for the state of Hawaii and the United States. And based on the data source that we, we used, we had to aggregate it for the past four years. And that was just a feature um, of the particular national survey uh, that we were using. And you can see here green in, is, is reflecting the, the uh, percentages uh, in Hawaii. And not surprisingly, um, alcohol uh, and tobacco form the highest prevalence uh, substances um, in, in, in Hawaii and also nationally. Uh, and we provided the national picture to sort of serve as a benchmark uh, under to, to get a sense of, you know, what substances uh, does Hawaii have a higher prevalence compared to the national prevalence. And so we see here that would be the case for cocaine, hallucinogens, inhalants, uh, and methamphetamines. Okay, and, and obviously you may have other particular concerns or interests given so many different substances out there, uh, but we've just presented this information here for you to share and, you know, reflect on and, you know, share your feedback. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, next we have substance abuse. So the previous slide was just substance use, and now this is a, a specific focus on substance abuse in the past year. Um, and again, you can see here um, alcohol use is also the highest prevalence, um, followed by, I think, illicit drugs and marijuana. Uh, but again, the substances where Hawaii is doing worse than the national average are uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, uh, and misuse of pain relievers. 
Okay, next slide, please. And finally, we have substance dependence uh, in the past year. And again, sort of a similar picture as we've seen before, um, where alcohol and nicotine are substantial, but now we see the role of illicit drugs um, as being substances of dependence. Um, and we see here um, the state, the substances where Hawaii has a higher prevalence than the national average, um, at least in the point prevalence in the numbers itself um, are alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, hallucinogens, and methamphetamines. Okay, next slide, please. Moving on, uh, given the particular interest in emerging adults, so adults aged 18 to 25 years, uh, we also pulled out these specific numbers um, for these you know, long list of substances. And not surprisingly, we see that the similar drugs that we saw for the overall population also appear. So tobacco, uh, alcohol, and mar marijuana use have the highest prevalences of all these different substances. Next slide. Uh, this slide uh, draws from information about um, ever using marijuana among public high school students um, by grade. And it, while it's hard to say definitively, but it does appear that there seems to be a slight decline uh, over time, um, particularly, you know, 11th graders, um, 12th graders haven't seen as significant, just from eyeballing it, a ste as steep of a, of a drop although we haven't shown any of the statistical significance about whether these are you know, really large uh, drops or not. The 10th graders don't seem to have as steep of a drop. And similarly with ninth grade, it seems to be both up and down. Okay, next slide, please. So at this point, I will pass it over to John. So hi, everyone. Um, so this deals with emergency room visits. And you can see that uh, there has been from, from, for this time period that there has been an increase in, especially in prevalence of alcohol, uh, amphetamines and opioids that have affected ER visits. And um, which is re uh, related to which, which is uh, information that been available to us. So um, regarding, so the next slide would be not ER visits, but inpatient visits. So these are. Um, Inpatient visits per 100,000 residents. Um, again, you can see that slight increases in inpatient visits due to alcohol and opioids, as well as other drugs, so which is a very interesting category. Um, we hope to gain more insight on. what that is, but again, when you look at these, this data, it, it sort of triggers a discussion of, of how it was collected, how it was reported out and uh, um, what each category contains. And so it's not surprising that uh, while it answers some questions on the surface level, it also invites more questions, which may lead to a fruitful discussion. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna give this to Jared. Aloha everyone and good morning. So for this particular slide, we're looking at overdose deaths per 100,000 residents by substance in the state of Hawaii and the United States from 2015 to 2021. And please note that the source for this is the National Vital Statistics System or NVSS. So in this case, we're looking at, we have cocaine, opioids, and also psychostimulants with abuse potential, which also includes methamphetamine. 
So if we look at the state of Hawaii, again, comparison with the United States, we're looking at deaths per 100,000. If we were to start at the bottom of each of these, comparing each dates from 2016 all the way up to 2020, part of what we're noticing is really an increase in areas, you know, for each of these. So when we talk about what are the concerns, you know, with regards to overdose deaths and how we look at mortality, the trend lines are certainly of concern when we look at deaths per 100,000 residents. So we can see in the direction where things are moving, 2016 relative to what happened in that four year period. Next slide, please. And looking at mortality related to drug toxicology results of drivers involved in fatal crashes in the state of Hawaii from 2018 to 2019. Now this is actually fatality analysis reporting system also known as FARS. And looking at several substances, looking at amphetamines, methamphetamine, stimulants, cannabis, opioids, other drugs, depressants, and cocaine. So we look cannabis um, in some ways, when you look at the previous slides we've had, um, that's really up 2018, you look at 2019. Um, looking at other uh, slides as well, uh, depressants, when you look at the count regarding drug toxicology results and other areas also include methamphetamine. And unfortunately, these are things are not surprised um, amphetamines are also up there as well. Next slide, please. So we're looking at substance abuse and dependence for adult arrest for substance related part two offenses in the state of Hawaii from 2010 to 2019. So we're looking at a 10 year period. And then you can see a number of graphs um, looking at alcohol related, um, drug related, both in the case of manufacturing as well as possession for you know, particular substances. So we look at the trend lines at the very bottom, looking at the count with the source for crime in Hawaii 2019 a review of uniform crime reports. Let's look at the one that is really very, very, very high. And again, unfortunately, much like the previous slides, look at alcohol related and DUI, which is extremely high. We're looking at really from 2010, really above 6,000, going above 6,000, dipping maybe a little bit, but still really very, 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 very high. And then I'm also looking um, at the dark red, which is alcohol related with regards to liquor laws. So other substances, certainly with regard to drug um, possession and manufacturing of concern. But again, alcohol is still one of those areas that is of major concern for substance related part two offenses. Next slide, please. And then juvenile arrest for substance related part two offenses in the state of Hawaii uh, for the same uh, period. And again, crime in Hawaii 2019 review of uniform crime reports. Again, looking at um, the green drug possession marijuana. So marijuana is something that much like with the previous slides, we know that this something is uh, related to a large extent. I mean, way above 400. And even though dipping down a little bit, as the trend line indicates over the current years, which in many ways is an outcome. It's good to see the trend line going down. At the same time, we still know that when in comparison with other ones, it's still one of the higher areas. And the categories are all alcohol related, drug, drug manufacturing uh, for different substances as well as drug possession. Next slide, please. And we're at the point of discussion. I'll turn it back to Dev. Thank you, uh, Victoria, Jared, and, and John uh, for running us through um, those highlights. So <clears throat> we do have some pre-prepared questions for this discussion section, um, but one question that came up in the question and answer window was um, and related to the timeliness of the data. Now, um, I think this is in regard to the emergency room and inpatient data. And Victoria has written an answer, but maybe I'll pass it over to Victoria to maybe elaborate a little bit before we jump into the rest of the question. Sure, I think it's a really important question. And of course, the state plan uh, seeks to be as timely and relevant as possible. Um, and the multiple data sources that we used in terms of the prevalence uh, data through the surveys the mortality data, the crime data, and of course the hospital data were all different sources of data that we needed to compile and pull together. And as much as possible, we did seek to pull the most recent uh, data where it was available or accessible 
And in the case of the hospital data, we were fortunate that we had uh, partners in DOH uh, and JABSUM who were willing to share their record level hospital data, very, very detailed hospital data uh, with us for this project. Um, there is some change with the hospital data systems. Um, the new system, the LALIMA data system, is an important uh, hospital data resource, and we're looking forward to uh, potentially collaborating with them uh, in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Um, so our first discussion question uh, is regards to use. So. Um, essentially, this is for the audience, but also, um, you know, for ADAT. Um, will the information in the statistical report help inform any changes in the services and programs? Now, it may be easy to say yes, but, um, you know, if you dive a little bit deeper, um, I was, you know, we're hoping to, to get some discussion going in terms of what exactly and how much. So maybe I'll pass this uh, over to either John or Jared to maybe um, elaborate a little bit. Thank you, Dev. So, again, we, we hope that uh, we hope to get the, the most recent available uh, accessible data that's available to um, kind of assess uh, just what the state of state of things are. And so, you know, uh, the team has looked at several dozen different data sources. So that, and it's much more than we can describe in this webinar. Um, this webinar is intended to offer you a taste of what the, the team has put together, both in the, their statistical report, uh, as well as um, the different chapters that have been compiled, put together uh, by some uh, subject matter experts that have graciously volunteered of their time um, to, uh, to do extra work outside of their regular duties uh, to because the, the topics were of interest to them. And so um, we hope to make those sources available to you. The links were made available earlier. I think overall, the answer would be yes. Uh, it's just that it's just the matter, it's just a matter of degrees, because when you're talking about needs of a particular population, then we'd have to look at, number one, what services are currently offered to that population? Number two, what services are needed? I think this is where getting community input is so key. It's so essential. Um, if even looking back at the 1977 plan, which Governor Ariyoshi signed, um, he, the, the, it involved considerable input from the community, from the partners, from the counties. And so this is what we hope to launch as a result of this webinar series, uh, more collaborations with you all. You're welcome to sit with me and Jared one-on-one -on -one, if you like. Um, and to, to go over perhaps some data that you are aware of that we are not aware of. Um, the UH team has looked through dozens of different data sets that are out there. Some are publicly available, many are not. And so uh, in the time that they did, they were able to kind of look and, and compile um, uh, some uh, uh, considerable volumes of of, of information that uh, can inform the way we, number one, we do our contracts, the way we monitor our um, the, uh, the services that we're paying for, but also the, the, the types of services that we are that we are putting out. In, um, you know, there may be services that are needed that we currently don't provide. And uh, we hope to learn from the community. I will not take up too much more of the time, but I think that's my piece. Jared, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think one question that I always like to know when we're looking at data and how to apply it 
This is really my question for you all um, who are either service providers or are connected in some way with making sure that consumers have access to services. When you see all of the data that's been presented today, what I wanna know is does this match your experience? When you look, if you're a provider, when you look at who's walking through the door, when you hear stories maybe coming, whether it's from consumers or family members and going, yeah, that, that really matches what my experience has been. That is typically what I like to know when I um, am going out and with you. I know for Angela Bolin, who also uh, looks at your programs as well, uh, we always wanna know, does this match your experience? So there's two aspects, there's the data, and we also want to know, does this feel right? Does this connect to what you and your staff are reporting? Because to the degree that there is that connection, then part of what John and I and ADAD wanna be able to do is let's ta start talking about what we can do to match in order to be able to provide support in terms of the resources and the services that are getting out there. And I just wanna follow up quickly, Jared, since you mentioned uh, Ms. Angela Bolin, who is our quality assurance manager. Um, one thing that the previous state plans may not have done or covered very well is workforce development. And I think that is a very key component uh, since the uh, current, our current veteran workforce is leaving the workforce due to retirement or whatever, uh, uh, for whatever reason, uh, there is a need to reach the new, the younger generation, the new generation. Um, is it is it worth it? Is it really worthwhile to be a social worker in today's uh, economy, today's climate, um, and given the needs of our behavioral health substance use workforce? I think if this plan can add a workforce development component, as well as talking about service delivery the admin, contract monitoring, um, the, the, our usual bread and butter, what we do on a daily basis, uh, as well as the service delivery aspects, I think then this whole effort um, would, would really, we, we, we would be taking it a notch even further. So thanks. Thanks, Jared. And thank you all for your time. Thank you, Jared and, and John, for those um, those insights. I, I do know, you know the discussion is kind of moving towards workforce development. I do know that Victoria um, may have some thoughts on it. Victoria, do you have any thoughts in, in that sense? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I completely echo what John and, and Jared have said. They're, the state of Hawaii is going through serious population aging. Uh, the baby boom is approaching a retirement age. Uh, and that leads to serious challenges, uh, not just for substance use, but for all sectors. Um, and so the, the aging workforce uh, will, will cause uh, challenges uh, in terms of um, the, the shortages that we are seeing um, in, the, in the whole state um, for, for all fields, actually. Um, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just like here that the, the broad, there's a broader picture of, of population aging. Yeah, and Victoria really tag teaming on what you and John have said. And I know we've had these discussions privately. The big area where data is absolutely critical is really in measuring workforce need. I think it's not only workforce need, but I know Victoria before we've talked about health economics and the importance of health economic data. Health economic data is not only, as we all know, everyone about looking at the services that are out there, but it's really about the health of our workforce. And so what salaries do addiction counselors and social workers, psychiatrists and psychologists and all of those folks out there, uh, licensed mental health professionals who are working, you know, all of us working with co-occurring disorders, what educational requirements, what are they making salary wise? What are they expected to do? This is where data becomes extremely important because it also informs educational institutions, it informs employers, um, it informs internship sites. Data, data, data tells us as a workforce what we, what we all need to be thinking about. So I think this is kind of the holy grail of 
really making sure we have the people who can actually provide the workforces, workforce needed to meet our providers so that they can provide the work services out there. Great, thank you, Jared and um, Victoria. Uh, we do have a question, a question that popped up again in the question and answer, um, asking about whether hospitals contribute to the hospital database. And yeah, the short answer is yes, there are only two exceptions in the state um, that, that contribute to the um, data sets that we have shown, uh, and those are Tripler and the state hospital. Um, moving on to our discussion, question number two, I think Jared already touched on this. Um, basically, you know, we, one of the things that we want to know is whether or not um, the data is, is speaking to the experiences. And since Jared has already touched on this, I think we'll move on to the third question, um, which is, has the COVID-19 pandemic brought any changes in the use of substance use in the state. I think this is a really important one, um, particularly at this point in time, although COVID uh, is starting to, well, hopefully uh, starting to recede uh, the pandemic. Um, I would like to um, pass this question back to our uh, panel. So this is John again, very quickly, since we're almost at the top of the hour, but um, yes, COVID has, we've seen some closures of provider offices. Therefore it has affected, has reduced the numbers of, of, of folks treated. This is for our, um, the clients served through our contracts. So it's a small subset of those being served uh, statewide. Um, we, we have seen a drop in FY21 from FY20 uh, client you know, numbers of clients served for the treatment population. Um, however, the prevention population has actually increased during COVID. Um, again, prevention services are more session-based. They're more uh, in the area of media campaigns and that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, community-based strategies are measured differently than, you know, than treatment services, which tend to be, you know, client level data. Um, but we have seen in FY21 a drop, but we hope that uh, with the expiration of this um, the, the previous governor's emergency proclamation. And hopefully if the current counts are stabilized soon, that uh, we can return to pre-COVID levels. Jared, anything? Regarding whether we can stabilize to pre-COVID levels, that's always the hope. <laughs> but overall. Oh, in terms of uh, changes in boy, the use of substance in the state. I think one of the concerns I have is uh, the ability of people perhaps to have substances delivered to them <laughs> at home. I think internet sales, and I think, um, I don't wanna name any particular service, um, but the idea that there's the opportunity to have things brought to your home by different delivery options. I think that concerns me uh, so that if you have a cell phone or any other digital device, um, you can do that. I think the other concern is the ability of people to be able to seek help um, when people are used to going in person and no longer able to do that. Um, what is the availability of people to have access to digital devices? And I think it's to quote you, John, you talked about tech equity which I think is a real good term, uh, tech equity, to what degree do people have access to devices that are really gonna make um, access to an addiction or mental health counselor available for people? And one of the things I think the pandemic has brought on is this realization that people are often cut off from services. How do we go ahead and provide a way so that they can have access 
I don't think we can go back completely to what we had previously. And so I think in no. looking at, so. Yeah, I agree, <laughs> you, I agree. Go ahead, John. No, I agree. Uh, we're interested in helping uh, folks that aren't familiar with the use of the web. You know, I, and I'm sure there are other entities that are uh, reaching those in the rural, uh, more rural areas of the state to engage and do telehealth and promote tequity as, as, as it were, but yeah. I'm, I'm just agreeing. Go ahead, Jar. Well, I think what this does is it gives all of us opportunities then to begin to think, how does our service delivery model need to evolve? And then how does our business model then need to evolve in order to be able to do this? Because if we look at the state chapters and that are gonna be coming up and we look at all of the data, the question is in a COVID-19 pandemic world, and um, it, if there's anything that's the silver lining to this, it highlights areas maybe where we are challenged, but I think optimistically, it also looks at areas in which we can grow. And so, where does our business model as a field need to change? Where does our service delivery model need to change? And how do we all work together really to bring those changes about? And the only way that can really happen is through partnership, which is I think why these series of webinars are excellent opportunities really to guide what type of data do we need to be looking at in order to be developing these business models and these service delivery models. And that's why I think data is always a useful platform it helps us ask these questions. Okay, thank you so much uh, to our panel for that discussion. Unfortunately, we are a little bit past um, the top of the hour. And um, before we let you go, uh, I wanted to again remind you of our upcoming webinars. Uh, please do register if you have not. Um, our contact information is in these slides. And again, these slides will be sent uh, out to you after this this webinar when it concludes, um, and um, included in the slides here we have the links that we provided earlier. Um, again, you know, for all of our participants. And finally, um, if you know, we would really appreciate if uh, our participants would consider um, filling out the post webinar survey that will automatically pop up as you leave. Um, Again, thank you so much for joining us. We do hope uh, that we will join us next time. And thank you again to our, our panelists for all of the discussion. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you, everyone. Aloha. <laughs>